Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. I'm Arij Mikati, Managing Director of Leadership and Culture at Pillars Fund, where I lead our storytelling and culture change work. I am delighted to be your host for this evening's conversation, Storytelling as Healing, with our incredible guest, poet and rapper, Omar Afendam. Today's program is part of Pillars Pop-Up Conversations, an ongoing series designed to highlight the ways American Muslims are using imaginative storytelling and cultural production to advance social change. Every Thursday, we have been gathering on Facebook Live with Muslim activists, storytellers, story changers, and others to learn more about their work and how we can all collectively create change. Next week, on May 28th, our Executive Director Kashif Sheikh will be joined by author Hanif Abdel Rakib for a conversation on the role of artists in crisis. The following week, I'll be hosting the season one series finale of our pop-up conversation series, Rami, From Pen to Screen, joined by Golden Globe winner Rami Youssef and Rami writers Meita Al Hassan and Amir Suleiman. We encourage you to follow us on social media, tweet using the hashtag Pillars Popups, and of course, post your comments to the Facebook live stream. Near the end of the program, we'll be inviting questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please post them. We'd love to hear them. Before we begin, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Pillars Fund, we are a foundation working to amplify the leadership, narratives, and talents of American Muslims. Pillars staff is responding to this public health and economic crisis by working closely with our grantee partners as they navigate this shifting terrain and by supporting individual community members. Pillars has announced a fund, now in its second round, for Muslim artists and activists who are experiencing economic constraints brought on or exacerbated by this current moment. Please subscribe to our mailing list and follow us on social to receive updates as they are announced. And now I am very excited to welcome you to today's program, Storytelling as Healing. The power of storytelling goes back to the beginning of time and transcends boundaries. Sharing stories is a valuable way to connect with others. Doing so can facilitate the healing process for ourselves and those we're sharing our stories with. Trauma, illness, grief, and change create frightening forests of discomfort. Listening to and telling our stories offers an opening to imagine the pathways out of those dark forests. Tonight, we'll explore the topic of storytelling, an age-old human tradition, and how it can be used as narrative medicine in times of crisis. To start off our program, I'm honored to welcome my dear friend and world-renowned poet and rapper, Omar Afendam. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum hey. as -salam. How are you? <laughs> I'm really well. I'm going to tell them a little bit about you okay. because there's so much to tell. Aww. Omar, you are a Syrian American rapper and spoken word artist living in Los Angeles. You are known for your unique blend of hip hop and Arabic poetry, and you've been featured on prominent world news outlets, lectured at a number of prestigious academic institutions collaborated with major museums and cultural organizations and helped raise millions of dollars for various humanitarian relief groups. You were also recently named a Kennedy Center Citizen Artist Fellow, and you are a member of our Pillars Fund Muslim Narrative Change Cohort. So no big deal. Not too much going on with you at all. <laughs> Thanks so much Thank for being here today. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And salam to everybody watching. Thanks for joining. Love it. He came yeah. prepared as usual. <laughs> Always Ahmad, it's, props too. <laughs> exactly. It's it's gorgeous. Uh, Ahmad, it's such an honor to have you with us. I, I you know, I've been a fan of your work for a long time. And I'd love for you to start by telling us a little bit about that work and your evolution as a storyteller over the years. Sure. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar with me, I mean you you just gave a wonderful bio, so thank you for that. Uh, you know, I am a rapper and a poet. I've been doing this work for the better part of the last 15 years, 16 years. Uh, I started out in college, uh, but I would say that the seeds were planted way earlier than that. You know, I grew up in a Syrian American household. My mother studied uh, Arabic language at uh, the University of Damascus uh, and had introduced me to poetry from the Arab world uh, at a very young age. Uh, I'd also studied it in school every single day growing up. I went to an Arabic Islamic school growing up um, where it was a big part of our education. 
Uh, and I'd also been listening to hip hop music. I grew up in the DC area, you know, where uh, BET was founded, where uh, WPGC, WKYS hip hop radio stations were really, really prominent. Uh, and so it was a sort of sonic backdrop to my youth. Um, and so that coupled with this poetry really kind of led to where I am today. Uh, I studied architecture at the University of Virginia and worked for a firm for about 10 years. But while I was doing that, I was moonlighting as a rapper and performer. Um, started out perhaps at more like, you know, smaller community centers and uh, event spaces and student groups and then slowly expanded the audience until I've had the opportunity to travel abroad and do what I do. And, um, you know, I'm just really, really fortunate to be able to have done it. Uh, the way that I did, which was independently, uh, not beholden to any sort of record label, or, and just kind of really following the inner compass of my of, of my life and my storytelling metronome, if you will. Uh, and I've really evolved over the last several years uh, into this sort of, I think, I might say more mature role of a performer on stage, oftentimes with uh, you know Arabic um, musicians accompanying me uh, and doing a lot of poetry um, and rap, obviously, and also anecdotal storytelling in between, and moving beyond you know sort of just telling my own story to um, doing my best to sort of uh, narrate uh, the stories of our communities more broadly. Um, so so that's kind of where I'm at today incredible. I'm so excited for folks to get to learn a little bit more about your work as we kind of move through the conversation. Um, and that's a really good overview of where you've been. I'm curious to know, um, in this time of uncertainty, many of us are turning to artists and storytellers, and more than ever before. Why do you think that is? You know, I think um, a lot of us, well, first of all, I should start it off by saying my heart goes out to anybody who's been affected by uh, this really? pandemic, um, you know, whether it's directly as a result of the disease or losing family members, um, or just also as a result of the economic situation that we find ourselves in today, um, where a lot of people are losing uh, jobs or are losing out on work. And I, I know that feeling very well, given that I'm a performing artist. Um, and then also to the fact that there are a lot of people who are at home dealing with different kinds of anxieties and depression as a result of not being able to interact with people more, more often. Uh, and so I think with that, that last part there has a lot to do with why people are really reaching out to, to arts and to um, artists and looking for that sort of connection. Uh, I think poets and artists are in the habit of sort of um, you know siphoning and crystallizing a lot of these experiences and a lot of these feelings in life. and. Um, you know, kind of just naming them and putting them uh, as poetically as possible, as artistically as possible for, for people to sort of ponder and reflect. And, you know, so we've, we, we have this, this practice that uh, we can rely upon in these times to help people through these times. Uh, and so I think that has a lot to do with it, um, whether it's directly addressing the issue, uh, the issues that people are facing, or just helping people sort of escape through storytelling, through, uh, you know, frivolity uh, and all of that. So I think, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important to find the balance and hopefully art can help people help people in these times. Absolutely, it's beautifully said. I think that those uh, familiar with your work will have likely heard the way that you interject and honor classic Arabic poetry in your storytelling. And I know that you and I share um, moms that love Arabic and love poetry. <laughs> and so we gotta give a shout out to the moms. Um, Absolutely. That's definitely something that's been ingrained in both of us that we've been able to connect on. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about why you were so drawn to poetry um, and who some of the storytellers that you have turned to in your life are for healing and inspiration. Yeah, you know, I think, um... Again, it's been a part of my life since as long as I can remember. Um, a lot of the poetry books uh, that I have in my library here were sort of inherited from my mother and father. And so it's it's been sort of in my DNA, so to speak. Uh, and I think, you know, something really beautiful about the Arabic language, when you study it, you understand how integral poetry is to it. And it's, it's really just a result of the fact that it was a language that wasn't written down for so long. And so poetry was how people preserved the stories uh, of the ancestors. And, and it was, you know, I think, sort of like um, the way that tribes are represented publicly, the way that um, beefs were settled, the way that, uh, you know, love stories were sort of passed on and the way that uh, loved ones who passed away were remembered. And, you know, it's just such a big part of our lives um, to the point that a poet could literally pack a stadium in the Middle East or North Africa or different parts of Africa uh, and around the world, you know, and I think it's it's that respect for the spoken word and for the tradition that is honored uh, that I think uh, is a line that I sort of come from. 
and that I think is also at the root of hip hop culture, you know, uh, and for for rappers to sort of be, you know, the ones who are um, shouldering this responsibility of each one teach one and making sure that we have a connection to our elders and we are looking to the future as well uh, is something that I don't take lightly, you know, given that especially nowadays, um, there's just so much music and noise, you know, and media out there that it can kind of get overwhelming. And so I, I, I look to the artists to inspire me to kind of help me th sift through that noise and really kind of find what's, what's essential uh, to, to my life and to add meaning to my life. And so when it comes to the storytellers who've inspired me, you know, I, I mentioned my, my mother's influence on me. You know, she's always a great storyteller and has a really um, impeccable memory, you know, for all kinds of little details that help sort of create a picture of what it was that she was going through growing up. Uh, her father, the same way, he was the only grandparent I knew. And I recall um, after prayer, he would, um, you know, when he would lead us in prayer, he'd turn around to us after the prayer. And that's typically what a lot of folks, you know, do an imam or a father, whoever's leading the prayer in the household or the mosque would turn around and, and you know, um, offer some sort of reflection, typically something religious. But I remember that he would, he would talk to us about all sorts of things. And it was that really beautiful sort of storytelling moment that will always stick with me. Um, I also had uh, a really important figure in my life, uh, Ammar Rashid Abbani, may he rest in peace. He was Nizar Abbani's younger brother. Uh, he was living in the DC area and he was an incredible orator and incredible storyteller. I recall us all just sitting around and listening to him for hours talk about life in the old city of Damascus. Um, the one thing that always kind of comes up when I think about him is how he, he talked about how beautifully integrated society was in, in Damascus. Uh, how you didn't even know if your neighbors were Jewish or Christian necessarily as kids, you wouldn't know this, you know, uh, and that everybody was friends and everybody had uh, this beautiful sort of shared experience of Damascus as a community. Of course, as they got older, they respected each other's uh, various uh, religious traditions and, you know, honored Christmas with their friends or Jewish holidays with their friends, etc. cetera. But uh, the idea was that there was this cohesion there that I think uh, is so beautiful. Um, and that's reflected in Nizar Qabbani's poetry, who I'll probably be talking about throughout this as well. He's a huge influence on me. For those who don't know Nizar Qabbani, he was probably the most prominent poet of the 20th century in the Arab world. A lot of his works were sung by some of the most famous singers. Uh, and he had a really beautiful sort of spread of, the of uh, thematic sort of uh, issues that he would uh, address, whether it was uh, love poetry, which he was perhaps most known for, but also political and socio-political issues, um, and also just really beautifully descriptive poetry about life in Damascus, um, which is important to me, given that I have roots there. Uh, and then, of course, the rappers, the rappers and, and the spoken word artists and the poets who laid the foundation for the work that I do, you know. Um, and from day one, I've had nothing but respect and admiration for people who were uh, able to, rappers who were able to tell stories through their work, you know, from Rakim to Nas to Tupac to, um, you know, Talib Kweli and Yasin Bey to more recent rappers like uh, Kendrick Lamar. Uh, I think it's uh, it's something that maybe not all rappers necessarily do, uh, though we're all telling a story um, at, on some level, but some actually really take that art of storytelling to the next level and, and talk about society through the lens of stories. And I think that's really powerful. Um, so those are just some of the folks who've influenced me along the way. And I would be remiss not to also mention, uh, given that I live here in Southern California, I've been here since 2004, and this has been a, a major sort of um, uh, influence on my artistic career in my life. Uh, and Dr. Maher Hathout, uh, may he rest in peace, was uh, the founder of the Muslim Public Affairs Council and of um, the Islamic Center of Southern California, and just a really major um, figure in the Southern California Muslim community, especially the immigrant community. Uh, and he had a lot of just beautiful gems that he left our our uh, our community with, like uh, home is not where your grandparents are buried, home is where your grandchildren will be born and raised. And so to always kind of understand that, you know, while you do respect where it was that you came from, you always have to be looking forward. And I think um, I'm grateful for that as well. I love that you, I love that you mentioned the um, way that poets were able to pack stadiums and, mm. you know, the Arab world. And um, not only were they able to pack stadiums, but there's such a deep oral tradition in our faith. I mean, the mm -hmm. Prophet uh, was right. known for inviting poets to the pulpit, right? Of to course. like share yeah. their beautiful poetry. And I, I love that they were also able to express um, their faith through that way. And uh, it's funny, you know, my my mom, just give her another shout out. She often uh, 
used to talk about how she didn't, uh, she, she loved um, Arabic poetry because of the way that um, you could create certain wordplay that she didn't think was possible in English. And mm. I love that you mentioned Kendrick Lamar because I was like, what about this? And she was like, oh, dang. <laughs> so I feel like Kendrick does that. He does that yeah. wordplay in a way that um, it, it was like deeply impressive to her as well. So I love that connection. De definitely. Um, I remember one of these, uh, one of the many jazz artists that Kendrick often uh, collaborates with, you know, he employs a lot of jazz musicians in, in his uh, production. Uh, and it's a collaborative process. And I remember, I don't know who it was, Robert Glasper or Kamasi Washington or one of them uh, was saying how when Kendrick raps, it's like he's playing an instrument, the things that he does with his voice, the way absolutely. that he understands uh, cadence and rhythm. Uh, and and it's very much like someone playing a trumpet or playing a, you know, a saxophone. And so much love to Kendrick for that. Um, and also, I think I just wanted to touch on something that you mentioned earlier uh, about you know, Islam and the relationship to poetry and the Prophet Sallallahu relationship yeah. to poets in the community. And to just say that, you know, quite frankly, there's nothing to me more poetic than the Quran. It's the most yeah. poetic text I've ever engaged with. And for that reason, I think it's like at the foundation of so much of what we do and believe, you know? Um, and so I'm grateful for that as well. Amazing. So it's a great segue into the next question, which is that, you know, in your work, you seamlessly are able to intertwine your Syrian heritage with hip hop, and you've created this new genre and perspective that is uniquely Omar Effendum, <laughs> right? And so mm. I know a year and a half ago, you released the video for your song, Close My Eyes, which I know you've previously told me is an incredibly personal piece of storytelling for you. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired that piece? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... You know, it's a, it's a eulogy, first and foremost, to my father. Uh, may God rest his soul and have mercy on his soul. He passed away when I was 12 years old. It was just me and him. And um, it's a moment that has stuck with me, you know, my entire life. It's something I think about every single day, especially now that I am a father. Uh, it just took a long time for me to really be able to put into words all the different things that I was dealing with. And um, sure enough, uh, after getting married and, and becoming a father, uh, so many things started coming up, you know, that I perhaps was suppressing. Uh, and so it um, it was really that that necessary outlet, you know, that that poetry and rap has been for me, but to the most personal um, sort of moment and story in, that I've ever had, uh, really, and most intimate sort of I've ever gotten. Um, and I think it was necessary for the healing and for the growth, especially as I've embarked on this journey of fatherhood for the last four and a half years. Uh, so. It's a eulogy. It's also a reflection on immigration, just more broadly, you know, given his story. And, um, you know, you see in the video, you'll see my son in it, me holding my son, Gibran, as well. Uh, his middle name is Abdul Latif, which was my father's name. Um, and it's also a reflection on Mother Nature. And I remember, um, you know, my father's connection to nature was really deep. He, he used to have a, you know, very strict uh, schedule of waking up at 5 a.m. to go for his morning walks outside uh, that he you know, do for like an hour, uh, just because he really wanted to spend time outside uh, every day. Uh, he did things like, I mean, aside from the hiking and the camping and all that, uh, bird watching, you know, things that like, I think um, a lot of us don't necessarily make time for in our lives. Today. Or maybe are no, now newly making time for, or right? Like in quarantine, I feel now. like it's like, what's really giving me <laughs> healing is just the storytelling of the world growing around me. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's a really good point. You know, I was just actually in my kitchen earlier today with my son uh, and I had the windows open and sure enough, like the birds were chirping in the morning. And he's like, shh, Baba, listen. You know, he's like, they're talking. So beautiful. Like, You're right, they are, you know, so. It's, it's all of those things, uh, close my eyes, you know, literally close your eyes and just think about the people that you love, your connections to this earth, your connections to the cosmos. Uh, and so hopefully people can understand it as that. Uh, it's not just a song or a poem, it's, it's a lot more than that. Um, and so that's why I wanted to share it, especially now, um, given the fact that a lot of people are also, perhaps for the first time for many, having to kind of reckon with uh, their own mortality or the mortality of loved ones. And I know how hard that is. Uh, it's something I had to just face really early on. And so it's something that I've, I've kind of lived with and dealt with, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's any easier. Uh, so, um, you know, I wanted to offer it to anybody who's lost a loved one or is losing a loved one and to just 
understand that the core message of the song is something that is so central to our faith practice. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un to Allah we belong and to Allah we all return. Uh, mm -hmm. To the one we belong and to the one we all return. And so it's meant to kind of remind people of that cycle of life that we're all a part of uh, and to give people comfort. And uh, something I like to always remind people of is that, um, you know, it is this cycle. And so in my life, whenever we've lost a loved one, it was always sort of accompanied with, uh, serendipitously accompanied with the birth of, of a new mm. baby in the family. And so to literally hear the wailing of people mourning mixed in with the, the crying of a newborn baby, uh, as difficult as it can be, it's just the most, you know, merciful and blessed reminder. Um, so I wanted to offer that as well. Thank you so much for that beautiful reflection and offering. And I'd actually love to watch some of that video with our guests. Yeah, now. that would be great. Saruna is the musician on the Qanun, by the way. Great. You know, ever since my father passed away, I wasn't quite yet even a man, you know, or even becoming a man, so to speak. It wasn't like, boom, he's gone, you know? It was like, whoa, there's like a transition there. Literally, that's what it, what it was. What I saw was a transition and not like an ending or something. I bet you thought that I forget. I'll admit I've often tried ever since the day you left I've been feeling lost inside waiting here with bated breath Patiently I recollect one foot in the grave full of step to take Now wait a sec I heard about it all before Read it in the ancient text messages delivered from the best of us To save the rest of us from grief stress in the weak chest speechless One tongue, two eardrums so speak less And yes the meek blessed with inherit in this earth But until then I worry for children who perish first Carrying thirst, walking miles for polluted water Buried in turf, lost smiles in a slew of martyrs Is this the type of life we're meant to be living? Where history's repeated, tragedies were reliving, huh? These were the kinds of conversations that we used to have But now that you're gone, I just speak to you in song I know what kind of man he was I know the kind of character that he embodied And that decades later, you know, I hear stories uh, from family, friends, family who say that he helped them get on their feet, he helped them get out of Syria, he helped them get a job, he helped them get a passport, become citizens here in America, he helped them change his life, he helped. I've just been really lucky you know, that, that, that that's what I saw first. You have an act for showing up soon as I close my eyelids. The world is black, but sure enough, your luminance is shining. They say no man's an island, and to me, you were a continent. Constantly reminding me to elevate my consciousness Now back when I was growing up You told me to keep smiling That no matter what the obstacle Nothing was impossible Timeless wisdom in your silence A language all its own Find a place your children's children love And gone and call it home And plant roots Watch your family tree grow to bear fruits Can't let that pride in ye grow Set aside your ego In the eyes of people We share truth we clear through windows To a soul center Find an equal Whom you love being alone But to get you through that cold winter This type of guidance you provided me was priceless I can almost see you smiling while I write this at night I just there was this like wave of revolution happening in Syria and things were kind of breaking up and we were all wondering will this be the change we've all been waiting for and that our parents hoped for and that we'll eventually all go back and fulfill that it made me feel even more fortunate to have the situation that I had thinking about all the sacrifices that men are making fathers are making for their families now I know Grieving isn't easy, but the tears breed patience. And Believing isn't easy, but the fears feed faith in that infinite uncertainty of certain situations. Recognize you're immortal, your demise is but a portal to surprises unpredicted by the limits of a mind. And so finite that only in hindsight do we ever find what's right in what was wrong. And this is more than just a song. Sometimes your heart will skip a beat, so you'll appreciate it more. And I keep calm and carry on. You wanna knock on heaven's door, I'm not so sure, brother, the line is very long. And since this very dawn, mankind has never been benevolent enough to get along. 
At least not on a global scale, so please begin at home. I pray when out a total fail, but indeed the good die young. Hey, yo, deep inside I know we'll be united very soon. That's why I say in that in that when that you lay you Facing the mortality of a loved one, your own mortality. Allah is everything, everywhere, always, you know. Um, and to the one we belong, to the one we all return. And you hear echoes of that in so many different faith practices and traditions all around the world, you know, throughout time. And there's references to that all over the place. In nature, you know, the fact that we share our DNA with plants and like <laughs> so much of it, you know, that then we just go right back to it. find this this comfort in that like knowing knowing that we'll go back to it so beautiful i love this piece it gives me chills everything from the monologue and storytelling that you do in between the musical storytelling and the lyrics the the visual intergenerational storytelling you're doing it's just a masterpiece so thank you so much for sharing that with us thank you thank you and i'd yeah. be remiss if i didn't also say thank you to wissam nasar who directed it and to saruna who um, was the musician on the qanun the arabic table harp that was uh, featured in there as well um and also to uh, the owner of a date palm farm in the Coachella Valley, uh, who let us graciously film on his property there. Um, I had this, uh, well, I, people who follow me on Instagram know I just love palm trees, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> it's how I connect. It's on brand. <laughs> you know, it's on brand. And um, yeah, you know, Southern California, uh, or the deserts east of here are home to the largest date growing um, you know, regions, operations in the Western Hemisphere. The fact that that's only two hours away from where I live and is so deeply rooted, you know, pun intended, to where, I, where I'm from uh, was something that I wanted to showcase. And I was grateful to have the opportunity to do that. They're, um, they're also just all over my neighborhood and all over Southern California, um, not just in that region. That just happens to be where it's hot enough for the dates to, to grow. Uh, but out here in LA, you'll see them everywhere as well. And it's hard to kind of close your eyes and imagine Los Angeles and not think of palm trees. Um, and I remember reading how a lot of these palm trees are actually not indigenous to Southern California. In fact, the overwhelming majority of them are not. It's only one uh, that is um, the Washingtonia, the very long, thin one. Um, the I'm one that kind of like bends over. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure the native peoples didn't call it Washingtonia. I'm sure it has another name. Uh, and I, but the, all the other ones kind of came with uh, the Spanish missions who settled uh, and colonized here in Southern California. But of course they weren't even indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula. They had come from you know, the Middle East region um, and from more specifically sort of Mesopotamia and Syria and were brought over by the, uh, by the Khalifa to be reminded of home. So it's just really beautiful sort of um, reminder, twice removed, of where home is for me, so to speak, uh, in my mind. But it's so firmly rooted and so much a part of the landscape here that I kind of wanted to feature it that way. Um, I and I remember that. during the uh, elections, this last uh, presidential elections, how much hateful rhetoric there was around, uh, well, Muslims and immigrants and Syrians, perhaps more specifically. And uh, it was also like, you know, ironically, uh, we had just given birth to our first child, to Gibran. Uh, and I was looking for some sort of sign, you know. Um, and I remember standing on my front porch and looking up at a palm tree. I'm actually looking at it right now. Uh, and um, and then remembering this this idea that they're, you know, that they have these roots so far away, but are so, so integral to this this part of the world. 
Uh, and I just, I felt, you know, again, grounded and, and very blessed in that moment. So honoring them too. I love that so much. Mm. How, how would you say um, the creation of this piece, you've already touched a little bit on this with the, the, just the metaphor of the palm trees thriving in a new place, but mm -hmm. how did the creation of this piece play a role in your own healing? Well, um, that's a great question. I would say, uh, first and foremost, to just to be able to kind of put into words a lot of these things that I've been feeling for decades. Uh, and, um, you know, to know that there were other people who uh, were going through similar experiences, you know, after releasing the song in a video, I got a lot of beautiful messages from people, um, just private messages saying how much they appreciated, uh, you know, the song and, and, and the lyrics and, and, and the visuals. And that, you know, that was certainly a big reason why I wanted to do it. Um, but also there was a, there was something featured in the beginning of the video as well, um, which was a, a 17th century living room from Damascus that was being restored by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the LACMA. Uh, and I remember getting a call from them because they had wanted help um, with translating some of the poetry that was inscribed on the walls. And then um, from that, it ended up becoming a conversation about, you know, being featured as a sort of like a, a voice uh, for the installation, for the exhibit. Uh, and then from there, ultimately, like creating a video piece for it. And then from there, working out an opportunity to film my own video in it, um, or at least portions of it in it. But to be able to walk into uh, a warehouse, essentially, a very nondescript warehouse off of Wilshire, Bo Wilshire Boulevard here in Southern California, and then just be transported into Damascus was um, honestly just such an important um, moment for me because A, I haven't been able to go back to Syria since 2010 mm -hmm. because of the political conflict. Uh, and B, because I have a connection to these, specifically to these rooms. I had studied architecture, as I mentioned earlier at the university, um, while I was in university. Uh, and I spent a couple summers in Damascus interning with the historic renovation committee. And so we worked in homes, old Damascus homes, just like the one that this room was in. Uh, and so it brought back just a flood of memories. I got really emotional. I mean, I even get emotional thinking about it, um, but it's just, uh, it was such a special, a special moment for me. Uh, and I was glad that we were able to also capture that. Um, in fact, it was really fascinating. You know, we walk into this warehouse and it was like a big black box. Dra it was draped in black curtains uh, with high ceilings. And so, almost like a Kaaba, you know, like you walk wow. in and then you like turn and then you turn the corner and walk inside it. And then this like explosion of color and patterns and marble and ornate woodwork and tile work. Um, and it's just like, it really, really took me back and reminded me of home away from home, mm -hmm. thrice removed as I keep saying, um, but also about how, you know, like even the wood in it, you know, comes from trees that were from those surrounding, you know, forests in Damascus. And just to be able to connect that deeply to to that space was very healing for me. Um, so, yeah, yeah. It, it just makes me think about how storytelling is not just an oral tradition, right? It's we Absolutely. can storytell with all five senses. And I love mm -hmm. that the connection that you just shared is is about like touch and smell and mm -hmm. taste and mm -hmm. just even just a sixth sense of just like vibe, you know, yeah, that, that brings us back to a place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. So and I think taste, of, actually, I just wanted to say like a lot of the, 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 the little like sort of uh, patterns that they have on uh, the paneling in the room uh, feature like little images of food because the family wanted you to know that you were graciously welcome to their space and that, you know, they would serve you all this delicious food. So it was like literally drawings of Betlawa and drawings <laughs> of like fruits and all around the walls. And it's like, all oh, all saying, you know, welcome, you're home. And so I thought that Incredible. was Incredible. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I, I think you often end up playing with different moods in your art. And so, you know, while close my eyes, is this like incredibly honest expression of emotion. Um, the pieces I've heard off of your newest yet to be released album are really honest expressions <laughs> of lightness and joy, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which have been bringing me a lot of joy. And I'm curious about how you think about your role as an artist as you navigate the creation of frivolity, mm -hmm. which I personally think and believe we deserve. Mm -hmm. And um, your work that is more obviously grounded in serious political critique. Uh, that's a really great question. I, I think it's just about balance, really, you know, I don't think it would be a fair representation of me as a human being to simply and solely be talking about politics 24 seven, because that's not what I like to do. Uh, there's obviously a time and a place and there are certain moments that are very necessary to speak on and speak up in. 
Um, and, you know, I, I feel like in many ways I kind of did that, uh, you know, for the revolutions in the Middle East, for the way that Muslims and Arabs generally have been dealing with xenophobia and racism and all kinds of issues here in America. Uh, and I will certainly continue to, it'll always be a part of my work, but it's not the full picture. And to be an honest expression of me and my life, it needs to have more than that. Um, and, you know, I even went down like a bit of a rabbit hole as I look back on my career. Um, some of the more popular songs and videos that were about these big political moments, um, you know, I ended up getting a lot of sort of media, uh, you know, um, hype around and interviews and it, it sort of felt like I was getting boxed in and started to get a little bit jaded by the way that, you know, people started to perceive me and not the whole of me. And so it felt necessary to start balancing it out. And I was really fortunate to meet um, a, a dear friend of mine now, uh, a producer, a beat maker uh, by the name of Thanks Joey, a fellow Syrian American who uh, has just a really, really lively, fun approach to making music. Uh, his music is really upbeat and it, it just kind of brought my spirits up. And so uh, we've been working on a project, which you've heard a lot of, um, we, we've been working on a couple of projects, but um, the album that's coming out in a month is called Lost in Translation. And it's really about my life here in Southern California and navigating these two spaces of Arabic and English in my head and in my heart. Um, in Syria, more broadly, there's a lot of really old uh, Syrian comedic film samples in uh, in the album that will kind of be funny for people to, to catch on to. Um, and really it was like the litmus test for me with this album was when I would go and record something at his house, I'd come back to my place and if my kids were dancing to it, it was gonna be on the album. At and the gym. So, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing more honest than the opinion of a four and a half year old and a one and a half year old, I'll tell you that. Like and. <laughs> And it wasn't always great. Like I'd come home and play something and be like, mm, yeah, no. you know, play the one from last time. Like, okay, that's the one then. Um, but it was necessary, you know, and it brought joy to my life and my, my family's life. And I hope that in these times of quarantine, this music can do the same for people at home as well. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited to be releasing it. In fact, even playing a little bit of it later on in this interview. So How exciting sneak yeah. peek. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think it's so important. I think we often focus on generational trauma and it's so important to honor that and dissect it. Um, but it's also crucial that we focus on generational joy, mm -hmm. uh, because there's so much to celebrate. So I love seeing that come out in your work more and more. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I think like, especially now, um, both it's not just within like, uh, you know, my, my sort of Syrian or Arab identity that I think this is important. It's also within the sort of um, culture of hip hop more broadly. Um, and here in America, you know, there's um, ideas of what it means to be a man of, you know, masculinity that I think can be very problematic. Uh, this also exists within the Muslim world as well, the Muslim uh, sort of spaces that I'm in. Um, where, you know, you can't talk about your feelings or you can't, you know, talk about um, whatever, you know, like there's a certain way to present yourself. And I'm just so grateful that I've had really key figures in my life, mentors in my life who broke that mold for me, who were serious when you needed to be serious, but were also, you know, very deeply loving and open about their feelings um, when they needed to be. Uh, I've, you know, and how healing it was for me to see someone who, you know, I would consider like, a bedrock of just like, you know, uh, how to, you know, truly be a man, but to see them sort of crying in those really difficult moments. Yeah. Uh, and, and how that was, that, that helped sort of shape my understanding of manhood in a more realistic way. Um, in a healthier way. Uh, hopefully a healthier way. And I think, um, you know, it's something that I certainly want to kind of impress upon my son as well. Uh, and, you know, you'll, you'll see me on Instagram starting a video with a flower in my hand, because that's how Damascene men do. Uh, I joke about it like, you know, we literally greet each other with kisses on the cheek and it's just like, uh, it's, it's different, but it's, um, it's not, it's not any less or more manly, whatever that means. You know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's important. And I think also nowadays people are kind of tired of all of that anyway, like the, the polarity, uh, there's so much more beauty in the nuance and in the gradation of all of these things that we used to understand as just this or that, you know, and that's the kind of the world that I find myself in. So amazing. So I have one more question for you before we go into a little treat sure. for everybody, which is that um, at Pillars, one of my favorite work streams is the work I get to do with you on the Muslim Narrative Change Cohort funded mm -hmm. by the Pop Culture Collaborative. Mm -hmm. And I am 
deeply inspired by that project, which Me takes too. you and nine other incredible Muslim storytellers, academics, and thinkers into the space of imagining the future of storytelling for, by, and about Muslims. Mm -hmm. And in our work uh, together, we're seeking to change the overall dominant and damaging narrative about who Muslims are to one that is more three-dimensional, nuanced, authentic, and told through a Muslim lens. Mm -hmm. And I think in this conversation, we've gotten to talk a lot about how storytelling has healed on an individual level. And I'm curious, what has participating in this cohort made you think about what storytelling can do to heal us as a community? And what does that look like? Well, uh, well, first and foremost, shout outs to all my fellow cohort members. Uh, it's the best. Really, they really are the best. Uh, it's, it, many of them, if not all of them, are people that I've known or crossed paths with over the course of my career and have wished that I could get to know more. Um, and so this has been an opportunity, first and foremost, to simply do that, uh, to get to know them uh, and where they're coming from a little bit better, a little bit deeper. Um, and to talk about these issues that are so important to us and to our communities, you know, uh, and which overlap, you know, yes, we're all Muslim, but you know, within that, as, as you know, and as I know, and as everybody probably watching this knows, there's so much diversity uh, of opinion, of thought, of background, uh, everything. Uh, and so to be able to be in cohort with them and to talk about uh, these issues uh, has been so enriching for me. Uh, and I think like beyond any sort of like, final product that we might come up with, which hopefully will be awesome. Uh, it's really been just the journey really uh, of getting to know each other and through this, through this, I mean, through this season, this time of the pandemic, uh, especially, um, you know, has been really, really um, healing and really helpful for me as an artist um, to know that I'm not alone, to know that these are things that we're thinking about, not just for this generation, but for all subsequent generations to so the best that we can to honor our elders in the process. Uh, I also wanna just say shout outs to Pillars uh, for handling this um, transition so gracefully. You know, We were supposed to be meeting in person and we're supposed to be doing so uh, many amazing activities together. And they, you, you all had lined up so many wonderful meetings for us um, that unfortunately couldn't happen as a result of this. And so it's become a lot more of uh, discussion-based virtual engagements that I really, really love. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that. And I think, um, we all know uh, it's like a huge task, uh, you know, to even assume that we could come up with some sort of major strategy that all Muslims could employ here in America. That's not the case. Uh, everybody has their own story that they're writing, uh, consciously or, or, or not. Um, but we're just hoping to develop a framework that is healthier for all of us to be able to engage within and with. And um, so also in the process, uh, I think, teach others how to understand us better, you know? Uh, and I think that's necessary. So thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. It would be, I mean, we truly would be nothing without all of you. So we are so appreciative that all of you have brought so much life into the project. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on storytelling as narrative medicine. And before we head into Q&A, um, it's funny, uh, some people know that, um, Ahmad and I have this sort of inside joke where anytime I ask him for a favor, he thinks I'm gonna ask him. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, are you asking me to perform in a broom closet? So today's the day, Ahmad, I'm cashing in. All I'm right. In, and All I would right. be honored if you shared a bit of narrative medicine with us by performing a piece. Absolutely, Arish, I would be happy Thank to. Thank you. <laughs> um, and this is for all the other times you wish you could ask me. <laughs> it means the world. Here, here it is. Um, no, but also I just want to say thank you again to everybody tuning in who's been watching. Um, we appreciate your support and your, um, your joining us in this conversation. I look forward to answering questions. Um, and again, I have an album coming out hopefully next month with uh, Thanks Joey called Lost in Translation and also a project that I would love for you all to check out called Little Syria. Um, well, I'm, where I'm retelling the story of the very first Syrian and Arab immigrants, um, majority Lebanese and Syrian immigrants who had come to the United States uh, toward uh, the, the latter half of the 1800s, settling in New York City uh, and creating essentially the very first Arab American community. Uh, and I use hip hop and the tradition of the Hakawati, the storyteller, uh, griot of Damascus as uh, a sort of vehicle to um, unpack some of, of, of this really fascinating 
uh, era in American history that a lot of people don't really know about because a lot of it was written in Arabic. And so being a native Arabic speaker and translator um, and a lover of hip hop, uh, it's, it's been a really beautiful project to, to partake in. Uh, not just with Thanks Joey, but with Ronnie Malley as well, a phenomenal oud player and instrumentalist based in Chicago of Palestinian origin. So when you get a chance, check out uh, Little Syria on YouTube and you can see our uh, little medley of the full show, which is about an hour. Um, that said, I'm thinking of a master plan. Cause there ain't nothing but the sweat on my mama brow but since we left Damascus with nowhere to settle down. Running like the river, couple babies in the basket, we get around. Tupac Shakur, who's got the cure to stop the furor of cops and war over hollow ground? When hearts were pure, the bombs were not. Who's got some more to drop and harm the flock? Manure, you talk? Shit. Holes that we coming from? Then why you digging in the dirt that we running from? Black gold in the desert got them plundering. This ain't a jungle, but sometimes I'm left wondering how many more gotta die for you? Listen, running out of breath, trying to catch your attention. Now ain't the time to go half on this mission. Give me liberty or death from your open air prison where it's too hot to fit in. No pot to piss in. Refugees, please, hands, knees, submission of the most high. Crossing the seas, no one most die. Praying a dry land close by. Why try? Unless we thought that it was safer than the places we escaped from. Head heavy like a bass drum, going wherever wind makes us, chasing them papers that you take for granite, like your kitchen counter, and all the meals that we waste on it. Only wish that we could taste some. Must be nice. Trust me, ice. Give us the chills when we face them. They kick us out and get a pay stub. Pyramid schemes of a mason. But by the time the right folks finally ask, should I say something? The wrong ones done erased us. Cause chosen ones never chose this. Tiptoeing on the precipice of indefinite exodus. The pharaohs want us hopeless. Only concern is his own bliss. Chauvinist on that presidential pulpit. New story with an old twist. Too gory for these poor kids. Lord, please help us focus. Send us another brother Moses to replace him. Send us another brother Moses to replace him. Y'all hear that? So this one's called Mjaddara for all my hungry fasters out there. <laughs> yes. Hey, Mjaddara, Msabaha, Muhammad, Msaa, Sabanik, Maani, Juz Muz Kus Kus Su Kuzbara, Badunis, let's do this. Benadora, Mafrumis, Sabulis, Zaytunis, throw it all in a panjara. I said, El Kibbe Kibbetna, Will Kibbe Rabbitna, Ulaula Kibbetna, Wallala Kilayatna Mitna, El Kibbe Kibbetna, Will Kibbe Rabbitna, Ulaula Kibbetna, Wallala Kilayatna Mitna. That's in part my ass. That was some false advertising. As far as I surmise, it's really more of a little bit. That white part on top is getting its flavor from the bottom. Closest to the heat. Watch us flip it though. Exposing delicious flow. Extraordinary style. Y'all just on some typical. Me, I am a Siriano sister, bro. Chickpeas, please. Out of here with your Swiss cheese. I am displeased. Give me that shinglish. Allow me to sing lead. I said, it could be a bit now. 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 Mette, knafe, magdous, and kibbek a bit, na, when kibbek a bit, na, or no, that kibbek now, a la, that kibbek a bit, na, when kibbek a bit, na, or no, that kibbek now, a la, that kibbek a bit, na, fadal, sharaf tuna, ahla, sahla, come on through, fadal, like sharaf tuna, ahla, sahla. You and you, in Quebec, Quebecna, in Quebec, Quebecna, ola ola Quebecna, walla la, killa ya tna metna. Quebec, this magical, mystical meat pie of my people. If you're gonna make it, you better make it right. Otherwise, many an Arab mama is gonna have a problem with you. <laughs> Yo, Ramadan Mubarak to everybody fasting. Hopefully that that gets you a little closer to a flat time. Uh, <laughs> you doing? know how I'm much fine. I love this one. We're doing oh, great. Man. We're doing I know, great. I know. I know. Okay. This is this is like the number one 
charting song in the McCarthy household <laughs> this Ramadan. So really delighted to see you perform that live. -ish. I wanna I wanna just say for all the people who don't speak Arabic, I was saying El Kibbe Kibbitna. Kibbe are these little, you know, I call them meat pies. I'm not sure if that's the right word for them. Um, cracked wheat, uh, bulgur wheat and meat sort of turned into a little shell and they put meat and onions and pine nuts and sumac and all kinds of delicious stuff inside it. There are vegetarian versions for the vegetarians as well. But kibbeh is just like so central to greater Syrian culture. And it's one of those things that there are like a million different versions of. And you could do an so, entire cookbook on just kibbeh. Literally, there's like the kibbeh guy whose job in life is to make every single kind of kibbeh. Uh, so yeah, I'm saying El Kibbe Kibbitna, so the Kibbe is ours, Wil Kibbe Rabbitna, and this Kibbe raised us, Wulawla Kibbitna, and were it not for this Kibbe, Wallala we all would have perished. So that's kind of the, the refrain there. Bars, yeah. literal bars. bars. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write that, by the way. That's like a well known sort of little jingle from Halab. So yeah. Incredible. Well, Ahmad, thank you so much for blessing us with that. I am like in a better mood than I have been all week now. Um, and I think this is, a, <laughs> this is a great opportunity, I think, to open up to some questions from the audience. So we'd sure. love to start taking those questions now. And there is one question here that I'm seeing that says, um, can Ahmad speak to how important healing is for us men? Because mm. we tend not to express ourselves. Yeah, uh, man, you know, I mean, I, I think it's so necessary. You know, I remember there's an Arab, uh, Arab Canadian, maybe comedian, Dave, uh, I'm not going to pronounce his last name right, Maherje, I think, uh, who I believe is on Rami, on the new season of Rami. Yeah, but he yeah. Had like a, a stand up bit where he's talking about his dad and he's like, my dad's just one of those Arab dads, you know, he's just like, Argh. he just like keeps it all in. Argh. He's just always like, Argh, you know, and it's funny, like he's not even saying anything and I know what he's talking about. Uh, and it just has a lot to do with the fact that I, I think I was saying it earlier, we just keep it in, you know, and I did that for many years with, with um, some of the most difficult sort of uh, things I've had to deal with in my life, and it and it doesn't end well, you know. Uh, it either leads to some sort of inner conflict and depression, uh, which can ultimately turn into physical issues, and I truly believe that, you know. Um, or, you know, you end up, you know, sort of uh, uh, lashing out in the wrong places to the wrong people or at the wrong people who don't deserve it. And so, uh, and I've seen that happen as well. Um, and so I think it's just really important for for men to get in the habit of speaking about their feelings openly and honestly, um, and as best as they can. I'm really fortunate to have had this outlet of poetry and rap to be able to do that. And every time I finish performing on stage, I feel like a sort of true catharsis. I feel better. Uh, and um, it's something I miss now, uh, I'll be honest, um, because of this pandemic. But I, I think it, it got me in the habit of doing this uh, and also being married to uh, the woman that I'm married to, my, the love of my life, Ashley, who is an it's actor wonderful. and actors are in the habit of also training themselves to speak about their emotions uh, as honestly and, and naming them. Uh, and so it's it's been really, really helpful for me um, just as, as a man, as a human being, uh, as a father, to be able to do that. Um, and when I don't, I know um, problems are a brewing, you know? <laughs> so I try my best to kind of push through that uh, hesitation. And it's just a matter of reaching out to the right people. I'm not saying everybody has to get up on stage and talk about their feelings. I mean, it's not for everyone necessarily to do that way, but to know that you're not alone and to know that there are people in this life, on this journey of life that you, you have, uh, that you can rely on in those in those difficult moments to reach out to and just you know whether it's vent or just talk through something, uh, it's very very necessary. And honestly, to to the guys who might roll their eyes about it, like just know whatever brotherhood you think you're feeling, it only gets deeper after you can kind of work through some of those things together, uh, and um, and makes your 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 brotherhood stronger, your manhood stronger, and it's necessary for for growth. So I encourage it. Well said, cosine. <laughs> uh, so we've got another question here, which is how can storytelling be used to combat some of the social ills that exist in our communities like anti-blackness, xenophobia, and Shiaophobia? Mm, uh, great questions. I mean, uh, you know, I think the, the answer is in the question. Like storytelling uh, is a way to do that, uh, whether it's uh, directly uh, or indirectly. So what I mean by that is like, if you're someone who's gone through that, who's experienced that, and you are able to put it into a story that people can can hear and reflect upon and 
just by virtue of being able to do that, um, somebody's going to be able to relate to it better. Uh, know that, you know. So just uh, take that first step. You know, be brave and put pen to page or type it out and and share it and you'll see that there's somebody that's going to relate uh, and it's going to help. It's going to be helpful without a doubt. Um, and also when you live more in the realm of like metaphor and you're able to kind of take uh, some really difficult concept that people are dealing with, things like what you had mentioned, the xenophobia, the anti-blackness, the shiaphobia, et cetera, uh, and, and use like a powerful metaphor uh, to to maybe get people who are are you know not necessarily as comfortable to to deal with that issue directly to to get them to think outside of it but to still see the correlations with what you're talking about um, to their own life or to the life of someone that they love uh, that is also extremely helpful and beneficial and so um, you know again directly or indirectly addressing them through storytelling can be a really really powerful way of healing uh, I think um, and know that once you've taken that first step others will follow. Uh, it's about opening that door uh, for people. You might not necessarily be the one who has to bear the whole burden of, of the story, uh, but you might spark something in someone else to be able to continue. And I, and I think that's also really important to understand that we're all truly connected uh, and not just like in this particular time, but down the line, you know, like I think about uh, Khalil Gibran's poetry and how much it means to me in my life knowing that I'm you know living a hundred years later and we you know we've never crossed paths but that sometimes I utter his words and it's almost as if mm. I'd written them you know which is so bold of me to say but I just mean like it's like it's something that I you know I connect to so deeply in that way and so um, you never know who it's going to touch and when you know you just have to be honest about what's what you're feeling inside and um, and that will happen mm. Yeah, and I think it's so important too, I think for storytelling to provide folks both windows and mirrors. So the mm -hmm. ability to see ourselves, to have that self-love and then be, be, be able to love others by seeing others. So I love the Absolutely. way that you shared that. Um, another question for you, for people who are not familiar with Arab poets, who would you recommend we start with? Ooh, uh, I mean, if you speak Arabic or you're looking to study the language, um, well, if you're looking to just start, I would say it's probably easier to start with more modern poets, um, just because uh, traditional classical Arabic poetry had a very sort of rigid like framework to it that would be really difficult to unpack unless you were more familiar with the language. Uh, and what a lot of the Nahda, the sort of like more modern poets had done in the 20th century um, was sort of break from those traditions and speak it plain, you know. Uh, Nizar Qabani in his book uh, Mashar, my story with poetry, it's like his self, uh, or his autobiography rather, his memoirs. Uh, he talked about how he wanted to create like a third language, you know. There was like the language of uh, the street, you know, which is just like Syrian colloquial language that him and his homies were speaking. Uh, there was a language of, um, you know, the newspapers and, and, and the classroom setting and like this classical Arabic tradition and what him and other poets had tried to do was create this third language through their poetry that was still honoring uh, the you know classical grammatical frameworks and not you know breaking too much and not necessarily you couldn't call it colloquial because it was technically classical Arabic, but doing it in such a way that it was much more accessible to uh, modern audiences and and also to people all across uh, the Arabic speaking world um, as a result of that. So because if he had spoken in his Syrian dialect, someone in Morocco might not understand him. But he was using simple enough language that was still fusha in a way that people could get it. So Nizal Qabani, I would say start there. Um, Mahmoud Darwish, a phenomenal Palestinian poet as well uh, in a similar, the same generation. Uh, and, and a whole host of others. For me as an Arab American, um, you know, the, the work of the Mahjar or like the migrant poets, which was what uh, that first wave of, of Arab American writers of whom Khalid Gibran was a part of. Uh, My guy. Yeah, your guy. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, they were also, they were like the predecessors to the Nizal Qabbanis and the Mahmoud Darwishas. And so their work is also like, it was that first step in pushing away from um, that, that, very rigid classical framework and making it more accessible because they were being influenced by the the, the stories and the, the books and the poetry that they were reading here in America, uh, Thoreau and Emerson, et cetera, and just were kind of more uh, in tune with what was happening here in the literary circles here and bringing that back to the Arabic language. 
Um, and so, yeah, I would start more current and then work your way back if you could do that. Um, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more question um, because I think this is a lovely one to end with. Is there a piece of advice that you'd, you would give to help one find their voice? Ah, wow. Um, I would say it's, a. I mean, to find their voice artistically or to find their voice just in life, um, I think those are two sort of maybe different things. What I tell aspiring artists often, uh, whether it's a you know, musician or a poet or a, a rapper or what, whatever it might be, um, is that you have to love the work you know, yourself first and foremost. You have to really love what you do enough to want to do it if there's nobody in the room. Um, yeah. And because that's when the magic happens. And then, uh, you know, to be, I guess, uh, patient with it, you know, I, there's this, there's this tendency towards wanting to kind of like make it big here in America and popular culture kind of pushes this sort of stress on us as artists. And it's like, if you, if you've been doing it for a couple of years and you haven't made it, then you shouldn't be doing it anymore. And all that stuff is BS. I think it's like, a journey in life that you have to be willing to to partake in uh, for the rest of your life, uh, and and it has to bring you that much joy. And to understand, it's a long game that you're that you're kind of that you're in here, and um, and that's when you'll find your voice. And as you mature as as an adult, as a person, your art becomes better because you've been doing that work for so long. Um, and so that's kind of where I find myself at now. Like I don't think it's what I would have envisioned my career to have looked like at age 18, 19, but I'm so grateful for the journey that I've had and for every single bump along the way because it's made me a better artist and a better person. Um, and I think just more generally, even if you don't have an intention of ever sharing it with an audience, uh, the idea of writing down how you feel, uh, mm. even if it's just to yourself in a journal or a diary um, or just a note on your phone, uh, it's, it's important because you, um, you know, you're naming those feelings and you're and you're understanding yourself better in the process and the way that you think. Uh, and you, once you do that for a long enough time, you can kind of look, start looking back at them a month, two months, two years later, and remember what it was you were going through, engage how much you've grown as a person and how much your voice uh, is becoming more in tune with your heart and with your head and with your spirit and um, and yeah, you'll be a poet and you didn't even know it. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I have to Not end it that. on a corny note because I'm a cheesy I mean, there you dad, go. So, you there know, you go. Yeah. You're a dad. It's okay. You know, it is okay. <laughs> you should see you my know, cheesy I, Arab dad dance moves. I might have to do a little video of that some. I was going to um, say, we got time. Not right <laughs> no, no, right now. Just joking. I'm, just joking. Life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, um, I really genuinely now I'm going to be corny, but it's it's genuine. I really do feel healed by this conversation. I think this is I mean, such a challenging time for all of us. And I am so grateful that you're able to join us and just open up your heart and your wisdom um, to us. So thank you so much. I feel like we could talk about this for hours and I hope we get to. Um, but for now, thank you so much. And I also My want pleasure. to thank um, our guests and audience for joining us today. Thanks, Palmar. Uh, just Thank a reminder. You. Yeah, just a reminder for everyone. Um, <laughs> every Thursday at 6 p.m. ET through the first week in June, we will gather on Facebook Live with Muslim activists, storytellers, story changers, and others to learn more about their work and how we can all make a positive difference. And again, um, we wish you all a blessed Ramadan. Salam alaikum, Palmar. Salam, peace, y'all. Take care.